Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome back to our evening program of the conference Hybrids Forging New Realities as Counter Narrative. We are really pleased to have today our special guest who arrived yesterday from the US to be today with us, artist, activist and writer Morishin Alayari. This talk and performance will be live streamed, so please stay with us and also greetings to everyone watching us online. After the talk, we'll have a regular Q&A, so please join. Uh, and please do remember to turn off your cell phones. Thank you. And now for a little background of our guest today. Morishin Alayari is an Iranian Kurdish media artist, activist and writer based in Brooklyn, New York. She uses computer modeling, 3D scanning and digital fabrication techniques to explore the intersection of art and activism. Inspired by concepts of collective archiving and cultural contradiction, Aliari's 3D printed sculptures and videos challenge social and gender norms. She wants her work to respond to, resist and criticize the current political and cultural situation that is experienced on a daily basis. Her work has been part of numerous exhibitions, festivals and workshops at venues throughout the world, including the New Museum, MoMA, Centre Pompidou, Venice Biennale di Architectura and Museum für Angewandte Kunst, among many others. She is the recipient of the United States Artist Fellowship, the John Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant, the Sundance Institute New Frontier International Fellowship, and the leading global thinkers of 2016 award for foreign policy magazine. She has been awarded major commissions by the Shed, Rhizome, New Museum, Whitney Museum of American Art, Liverpool Biennale, and FACT. Please welcome Morishin Alayari. She who saw all things in a broad bond earth and beyond and knew what was to be known. She who had seen what there was and had embraced the otherness. She to whom the image clung like a mirror, a display of crisis, and who dwelt together with a devised becoming. She knows and sees the unknown and lays them bare. She's the monstrous other the dark goddess, the possessive djinn, the dividing persona. She restores myth and histories, the untold and the forgotten, the misread and uneven, those of and from the Near East. Her name is Kabus, made of smokeless fire She's the djinn of horror and nightmare, accompanied by the right and the left witness. She enters, she enters to hold you down in your sleep, lying down on your chest, your body paralyzed, your mind spills over into a waking consciousness. Even when you think you have woken up, woke, you are dead asleep. So find yourself here, in this temporal ritual of opening path. Kyo <laughs> 
که من را در زندگی رازی نباشید و من را محکوم به زور نمایی که چرا تو را به دنیا آوردم خواهش میکنم این را ندیم هر که رو هیچ را من سعی میکنم زندگی خوبی بقیت درست کنم به احتمال زیاد تصمیم دارم که تو را در آمریکا به دنیا بیاورم Summer 1991, on the rooftop, we're lying down on a set of sheets, looking up to the stars in the polluted sky of Tehran, occasionally this clear. And you, Grandma, Madi John, you tell me the story of a djinn that you saw in the public bathhouse, where it's you and some other women on a bath day, washing, gossiping, and singing. You hear a woman calling your name, scrubbing your body, you get up, walk to the other side of the room to find the voice. The bathhouse is dark and steamy. You walk towards the voice, search, but find no one. You walk back, and that's when you see three women you hadn't seen before, standing on a corner next to the staircase. You stare at their face and walk closer to see if you know them. And once you get closer and look down, you see that their feet are hooves, like a horse or a goat. That's when you knew you had seen a djinn, and you swear the morning after Iraq bombed your hometown. My mother was pregnant. Shambi is a ship in my مدت هاست که چیزی ننوشتم روزهای سختی را گذراندم بسیار دلخور بودم از زندگی نکبتبار جنگی جنگ چهره بسیار کلیهی دارد زیرا جنگ چیزی جز شکست همراه ندارد حتی پیروزی اش هم نوعی شکست است بیش از دو سال است که ما با عراق در جنگی و این بسیار تا از برساست مهرات سردائی که بسیار میتشم دارم در میدان جنگیت و خبری از اون نداری و جوانات دیگر نیست کن بود همه جا مرد و حقوم و سیاهیست زندگی بسیار قفت است زمانی که هم وطن خود را در خواب و خون بیمینی مردم عادی از بچه تا بیر چه بو نمیتوان به خود خود بخی و زدهی کردن یا امیدوارم تو حریز این بود کار را ندینی پیدر از اتحان رفته و فکر میکنم با دون زدگیر برگرده what it means to hold up, whether it's for death or for life. Where do I begin to tell you 
about the time after time when we stood behind the window in our kitchen anxiously. Waiting was our ritual, my sister and I. As if, if we waited long enough, our mother's plane would land. It was a non-spoken play of cause and effect. Waiting causes return. I would feel nauseous. How do I begin to tell you about the time after time when being born felt like a personal attack? I took offense to it. First, my mother's job meant flying during the war, then it meant flying post-war, when there were sanctions imposed by the US, which meant difficulties in renewing parts of the planes or permission to purchase new ones, which meant more plane crashes, which meant every time she left, I clung more to my grandmother who stayed. As a child, I had already imagined my mother die so many times. When my grandmother died instead, it felt like such a betrayal. What I mean is that I kept asking my mother, how could your generation give birth to this many of us during the war? It was our only hope, she said. Dear left witness, they say you have subverted time so profoundly we can join the army of mothers who carry trauma in their bones and will give birth only to monsters. My beloved child, even now that in my 30s, I walk around the world picturing everyone I love dying or leaving me because I have learned I don't deserve their stay. My therapist called it an extreme case of separation anxiety. That's what the scientists call the knot in my stomach. Inside my body is so occupied, it confirms the outside does not deserve you. And that's why you are not to be born in blood and flesh. To not be born in blood and flesh is to be protected. To be not born in blood and flesh is a form of becoming. Becoming is alive and always in the future. To heal my mother, our mother's mothers, our mother's mother's mothers, our mother's 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 mothers. To become other and alter our daughters, our daughters' daughters, our daughters' daughters' daughters, our daughters' 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 daughters birth justice, to choose when, where, how, with whom, and what to birth, what to birth. The ultimate extent of power is this union. Only in the future you will know. Only in the future you will know. Only in the future you will know. The only future you will know. Thank you. Um, hi, and um, I wanted to first Thanks everyone who's been involved um, in making this, this trip happen to Marina and Caroline um, and all the crew and staff here. I'm honored to be here. 
And um, I kind of want to switch from this performance to talk about a series of um, work that is part of uh, this project called She Who Sees the Unknown, which I have worked on um, since 2017. And I just, uh, four or five months ago, I just finished the last component of it. Uh, this is the work that focuses on the stories um, of uh, monstrous gen uh, figures that are female or queer, non-binary figures in uh, the West Asian Islamic uh, mythical stories. And the reason that I kind of started to get interested in this project was kind of, um, you know, some of the previous projects that I have been doing where I, I have been sort of interested in this relationship non-binary relationship between technology um, and history and also with this specific project kind kind of wanting to um, know where are the stories that are about these kind of you know powerful figures but are focused on um, again female or genderless um, figures and figurations growing up in Iran I think like most of my experience was always like reading so many you know like mythical stories and poetry and a lot of material like that and it was always these like male figures that was you know spoken about so I was curious to kind of do this research and find these figures and be able to um, use their stories to tell then new stories about them this is one of my favorite quotes, uh, kind of that does a perhaps good job of summarizing why I'm interested specifically in the monstrous figure um, and also kind of stories that kind of sits perhaps between also this uh, relationship between dystopia and utopia and horror science fiction um, in, in some ways. So it says we need to engage with dystopian fiction that extrapolates from the white, able-bodied, colonial heteropatriarchy that structures our world. Um, I am going to you know, talk about the five main figures as part of the She Who Sees the Unknown series and give you like a little bit of explanation about who they are and then a little bit about their, their narratives and stories uh, first. So this is the first figure that I worked on. Um, her name is Huma or Homa, which in Arabic means fever. And she is um, a, a figure, a gen figure, specifically gen figure that is known uh, to bring fever and heat to human body. And for some of you that might not know, I guess I will just give a very quick explanation about what gen are or um, the, the English version of it, genie, but I'm just going to stick to gen as the word. Um, so jinn are these creatures that are spoken about in you know the Quran. So in the Quran, there are angels who obey, devils who disobey, and then humans and jinn who both have the power or the will to obey or disobey. And also jinn are figures that are you know very present, like their stories are very present in the um, most Islamic cultures. Uh, in the Middle East, etc. You know, I, as you saw in, in the video that I showed, which I will explain more about in a bit, um, I have a whole story about my, my grandmother talking to me about a story of encountering a jinn in a public bathhouse, which, by the way, was a place that a lot of people would say that they would encounter jinn because they are um, jinn come in places that are like dark and humid. Um, so they're very present culturally in like an everyday life kind of setup as well. Um, and uh, Huma is, um, you know, a gen that's through basically br bringing disease and kind of like, again, bringing heat and fever into, into human body. So um, what I did with her figure and her story was, one, uh, to build, you know, like an installation. So, you know, I've 3D modeled um, her illustrations. You know, this is from one of the material that I've used, um, which also I will talk a little bit more about later when I talk about the archive. Um, and I create these installations that have like multimedia, um, you know, dimensions to them. So there's a sculptural element and then she has her own talismans. These are all uh, 3D printed and a video where the audience member like enters the space and, you know, watches the video and the story, the new story that I'm writing about um, her in this case. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting talking about Human now because uh, this was, as I said, the first figure that I worked on, and this was in uh, you know early 2017. 
And when the pandemic happened, um, I had a couple of friends like emailing me saying, uh, you know, I can't stop thinking about Huma, you know, Huma, this gin that brings like fever to human bodies. So do we need her to kind of like take away this whole like disease or away from us? And how I wrote her story at a time was to kind of relating this heating, the heating of human body and then, you know, the earth, the planet um, to uh, climate crisis and Huma being this gen figure, this creature that comes to bring justice into conversation around um, climate crisis. And how when in, in this case, when we experience or the experience of climate crisis, obviously, whether the ways of thinking about it to solutions to it has always been, you know, very like much westernized and uh, focused on first world um, countries or global north countries and and their problems. And um, with with the with the pandemic, I think it like really became became a much more practical experience. How whenever you experience any any kind of crisis in a, in a way that is global, there always will be differences in the way that we have access to two things, you know, like, let's say with the vaccination access to um, this whole COVID situation and how there are people like, let's say in a lot of countries in Iran, who are not gonna people are not going to be vaccinated for probably like two more years. And even if they get vaccinated, the variety of vaccinations that are available is just not, you know, as as much, um, I guess, approved or like known to be working or not. Um, so how race, uh, basically your, your class, um, your, your, where, whatever country you're born in, all those things really changes the experiences of how we will experience any kind of crisis in this case. Um, yeah, the, the global warming, but, um, the video that I made for Huma, which I'm not going to show today, but you're the more, you're more than welcome to check it out on my website, um, talks about kind of this fictional and factual relationship between these, these dynamics. And this is the second uh, figure. Her name is Aisha Kandisha. She's a Moroccan gen who is very um, honored and also feared in, um, you know, Islamic cultures, but originally, again, coming from Morocco. And uh, her story is that, you know, she's a gen that uh, comes and basically uh, possesses mostly men. And she creates literally a crack on their body, opening up the male body into an incoming data or traffic zone of other jinn and demons. And the only way to not go insane when you're possessed by her is to participate with her, is to obey her and listen to her. So with, with her, again, this is her sculpture. And this is the installation that I created in which her sculpture sits within this kind of um, blood-ish pool. And there is like the video behind her. And then I related her story and her power into different ways of thinking about um, love, revenge, uh, and then toxic masculinity, like a little bit of a, more of like a personal story um, that, you know, I, I, I connect her to. Um, this is, uh, you know, during this, this research that I was doing uh, about this whole project, um, Rosie Bredotti obviously was like a very important figure because of her ways of like writing about monstrosity and monsters. And this is a quote that I think also does a very great job of um, thinking about monsters, which in the next project um, I will also get into a little bit. But she says the monstrous as a borderline figure blurs the boundaries between hierarchically established distinctions between human, non-human, Western, non-Western, and so on. So this kind of, uh, this, this project, I think does a really great job of, um, again, explaining further the, the reason that we need these figures of monsters and monstrosity within our lives and their narratives and their stories and what that does to us when we have access to those figures, right? Being able to imagine this kind of like power, turn around power structures within these stories or tell stories that, um, you know, let, let us see other ways of, you know, seeing through or reimagining the possibilities of the future. So this um, is a story of Yajuj Majuj, who, again, their story is talked about in the Quran. So Yajuj Majuj are known in the Quran as this community or group of people who represent chaos. And then the story in the Quran is that um, a group of people, you know, from this city come and say that 
um, to this person, which some say um, is Alexander the Great, or some say another person called Zoro Karin, um, they, they tell him that we want to build a wall to keep Yajuj Majuj out of the city. So they, they build a wall and Yajuj Majuj as, are like basically behind this wall. But this more of um, Islamic interpretation of the story is that when they come and when they break through this wall is when we're going to experience some kind of ending. And they, they refer to it also as the end of time and not the end of the world, which I also find very interesting because I feel like the end of time, like a time um, kind of promises some kind of like newing in a way that is very different than just dystopian end of the world kind of view. Um, Anyway, so I was reading about this story um, kind of right after the, the Muslim ban happened in the US where I was, you know, stuck in, in Germany for a little while um, when the ban happened because I had Iranian passport and a green card. And some of you might remember at the beginning, green card holders were included. So it was a very like weird moment in terms of kind of like being stuck and not knowing what that means for my life. Also not being able to go back to Iran because of my work. Um, it was like a, yeah, very like the unknown was just like very intense at that moment. And obviously I had the privilege of having the green card, being able to come back. Um, but then this story just made so much sense, like reading about the wall and building a wall and how through many, many centuries, humans always have found this other, you know, to, 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 to other and to make other off and also to keep behind some kind of wall. And so I wanted to write a, a story about Yajuj Majuj that kind of questioned this, this notion of the, the othering, but also this monstrosity, right? Like the fact that people, not just Trump, but like in general, the very like populist agenda or like racist, uh, xenophobic agenda has always been talking about the other in a way that is dangerous, that is scary, that is um, not to be trusted. And um, how then, turning that around as like, instead of kind of um, having to constantly like say that, no, look, I'm a good immigrant. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I pass all these things that you have defined for me. I think that's something that I try to do when, when writing this story to question, I guess, this, this roles and the way that we can think about it. I remember like one of the conversations that kept coming up um, when when I, I had posted on my Facebook that I was like stuck and then after that, you know, like a lot of other conversations around the ban was that people would say, you know, but the US should be like so happy to have you, you know, or like, you know, people would say, but this person is a doctor, that person is a lawyer, why wouldn't you want that in, in your country? And I think, you know, I, I see the positioning, but at the same time, I think like positions like that are also very problematic because it's like you have to be this other thing to be worthy of living in a place. Whereas you don't have to have any kind of position like that to, to, to you know, um, deserve a life that comes with like, I guess, human, human rights or like whatever, some kind of comfort that you're looking for and that's why you're leaving your country. So to, to embrace this monstrosity then monstrosity from their position it was something that I also have been interested in, whether in the story of Yajuj Majuj, retelling the story of Yajuj Majuj, where the position of the people who want them out and Yajuj Majuj shift, asking who is, who is crisis, who is chaos for who, etc., cetera, is um, something that, you know, I've been wanting to raise and talk about. And then um, this is the story of the laughing snake. She is um, a snake uh, known to um, you know, in, in her story, like up there, it actually says in Farsi, um, the figure of the laughing snake and the mirror. So she is a figure that's a jinn also going through all these like cities and towns and killing all these people and fighting all these animals and all these battles. No one can kill her until someone comes and say the only way to, to kill her is to hold a mirror in front of her. And um, when they hold a mirror in front of her, which you can see there are these like men holding a mirror, and she sees her reflection and then she starts laughing and then she laughs for days and nights until she dies from laughter. Um, and with this story kind of, um, and within the tradition of, again, this body of work, I kind of wanted to think about writing a new story about her that was the, the, the death was not a point of weakness, right? Like to turn around that as something that her death or her destruction of her body 
means that she has now ownership of her body. Like she controlled something within her body image by, by basically dying through that mirror or the reflection that was, that was showing her, you know, in the hand of those, those men. Um, so for this, I wrote, um, I was commissioned, um, co-commissioned actually by the Whitney Museum and uh, FACT um, to work on a piece that would be a net, net art hypertext work. Um, and that, you know, it took a shape of kind of like open-ended storytelling where you start from like a linear narrative and then the story takes different parts and then you know it, it, you you go to like many different directions and it it relates to um experience of sexual harassment and street harassment growing up um in iran which i feel like um you know when the me too campaign stuff was happening again uh, it was constantly about, very much about the dominantly about the problems or the experiences of, um, you know, white women or like women in, in the Western countries. Like rarely we had any amplified voice that came from other cultures and the experiences of women in other cultures. And um, it's that the street harassment experience is like super like intense and very like specific, I would say, like in Iran and I think brother in, in the Middle East. And I kind of wanted to write a piece that was both personal and a collective experience um, that, yeah, talks about some of those. So um, again, unfortunately, don't have enough time to show all these like narratives, but please feel free to, if you go to my website, shewusisdiannon.com, this part of the project, you can find all this information. Okay. Um, and then now we come to the last figure from the series, which was the work that I started with, with, with the performance. So this is the story of Kabus. Uh, Kabus is known as a creature, as a, as a gen creature that causes sleep paralysis. You know, like literally sitting on your chest and creating um, that feeling of sleep paralysis. I'm gonna ask a really awkward question. How many of you have experienced sleep paralysis? Okay, see some hands. Yeah, so I have and it's super scary because you kind of you you kind of like get divided into like two people where you're like you're like standing on outside of yourself basically, but like you see yourself in the setup that you're in, like literally in your room, like you see yourself or like in another setup, but you there is another you in that scene and then you can move. I mean, there's obviously I mean, when, when doing this research, I, there's a lot of like scientific reason around why it happens, why your brain, your brain shuts down um, a, a certain part of the parts of like your body and um, your body is basically in this paralysis mode, but, but your brain still has consciousness. And that's kind of this, the, the scientific explanation of it. And I was doing all this like research and like reading about it and found a couple of studies where like, for example, some of them were done at refugee camps where people in refugee camps experience more of sleep paralysis. So it's very connected to also stress or like trauma. Anyway, so this story, you know, as you can see in the image showing Kabus and uh, yes, sitting on, on your chest and, and causing these like set of different experience of nightmare. And I wanted to write a piece that connected this, this experience to intergenerational trauma. And um, that also happens in the bathhouse where my grandmother told me she saw the gin. And also public bathhouses being like historically, I mean, obviously they're not, they're not common anymore in Iran and I think most, most countries. But back in the day, during my like, grandmother time, they were pretty you know, popular. So my grandmother would go there with all these like other women once or twice a week and it was a very intimate space for women it was a place where like women as i mentioned it in parts of the text they would like hang out and sing and talk and gossip and find husband for someone and um that that intimate space was something that i always like kept in my head in terms of um yeah relating the gen story that my grandmother told me so i did all this research on the architecture of different bathhouses in iran and kind of made a mesh up or like a mix up of it by the way this piece is in vr um originally i just show you the 2d documentation of it and i think it doesn't do justice like how you experience it in vr um it's it's much more intense in a way that i wanted it to be um so I work with a group called um, Perio Interactive, which helped with the coding aspect of the VR. And this is the installation. 
Um, and so you come as an audience member, you walk into this space, there is the sculptures of what I call um, made up names, the right witness and the left witness, and you lie down on the bed, you put the headset on, you experience this basically nightmarish narrative storytelling. Um, I, the, when I you know, started reading, and then there's the second and fourth part of the reading, which you hear my mother's voice, reading from her diary, which she wrote during Iran-Iraq war when she was pregnant with my sister, where she's you know, questioning if she should give birth. She doesn't know if it's the right decision. It's you know, the war, and she doesn't want us to like, later feel cruel about her, her choice. Um, so it's kind of working. This, this piece was very like, special for me because of also collaborating with my mom on it. It was something, this childbirth conversation, not that my mom cares if I have a child or not, but like I always from when I was like 18, I was like, I never want to have kids. And she's like, yeah, but when you get older, you will. And I still don't. So um, but it's kind of was building this relationship with my mom and then, you know, my grandma telling the story and then this imaginative um, monstrous daughter at the end, which talks about healing. The only way to existing is through healing those intergenerational trauma and to do that not being born as a human, like having to be born as something else other than human, more than human, that then allows for re refreshing or redoing, restarting, or I don't know, rebuilding another cycle, I guess. Um, and so as part of this body of work, She Was the Unknown, I've done a lot of like performances, um, lectures, lecture performances, collaborating with here uh, artist Shirin Fahimi, which um, has been like a multiple co collaborations, multiple spaces uh, at this event, um, sorry, at, at, at the performance title um, being called um, Breaching Towards Other Futures. And um, these events I like to do, which I called refiguring um, a word that I also coined and developed as part of the She Was Is the Unknown series, thinking about refiguring, refiguration as this process of going back and reimagining the past and through reimagining the past, being able to think about alternative possibilities of now and then the time to come or, or the future. So I would call these events refiguring events where I would set up these kind of like casual sitting down where it wasn't as much of this where I'm just talking, but it would be like audience members sitting around and every, all of us talking about different, our own research or, you know, here I invited four, um, I mean, three other scientists, designers, artists, where each talked about their work and its relationship to the concept of refiguring and the audience participated in that. Um, and kind of now I'm shifting a little bit of my focus to the archive. Um, so while I was working on this series, I started gathering a lot of material. You know, these the, the five figures that I showed you are just five selections from hundreds and hundreds of, of resources, images, material that I had gathered, which um, the reason that it was kind of like hard to find this material was because of kind of the focus that I was having. Again, starting from a place where a lot of this material were un underrepresented, forgotten, and I was trying to kind of like pull them together, bring them together. And I was sharing my research process um, through exhibiting this work, you know, from, from 2017 when I started showing the Humas figures and then more figures I made, I would always try to include uh, a reading room where the audience members could come and look through material, read through material, and spend time with, with the research aspect of the project. And uh, as I mentioned, five months ago, I released an archive which contains um, a, a curated selection of the most, some of, some of this material that are really rare that we had to like scan in different libraries or found through hacking some websites. Um, or, you know, I, I will talk about the access aspect of it, but it was kind of like really hard to pull together. And also um, I worked with um, um, an archeologist and also a historian of specifically Islamic studies in Iran, where she helped me, um, uh, her name is Jale Kamali, and she helped me to um, write, like do listing, like write a listing of all this material that it, it didn't exist before in this detail. But um, what makes this project kind of like a little bit different perhaps than any other kind of archiving work that I've done, which is, has been a big part of my um, work in general, is the way that I thought about releasing this, this um, material. 
So I worked on, in 2015-16, a, seri a series called Material Speculation Isis, where I reconstructed some of the artifacts, uh, 15 selected artifacts that were destroyed by Isis at Mosul Museum in Iraq, Iraq in 2015. And um, as part of, I'm not going to talk about this project, but as part of this project, one of the things that came out of that body of work what was this concept of digital colonialism, um, which I you know, at a time in 2016, I kind of coined and developed in specifically in relationship to cultural heritage. And this is my definition of digital colonialism, which is that it's a framework for critically examining the tendency for information technologies to be deployed in ways that reproduce colonial power relations. So as you can see with this definition, you can really expand this to many things. It doesn't have to be on cultural heritage. Um, but with my work, I was thinking about the use of 3D scanners as these like new tech, newer technologies and 3D printing um, within these like tech capitalist, um, you know, companies and spaces and the issues of copyright ownership, monopoly of information, monetary benefits, where a lot of these companies, for example, would, would go to, you know, different parts of the Middle East or Africa and they would scan this material, different historical sites, etc. But they would have ownership of all the data. They wouldn't give up like access to even the country that they went to. You know, sometimes even the country that that they went to, the, the governments of the country that they did the scanning at. And I was kind of just you know researching and studying these things and reading about it. And obviously, one of the very like kind of easier examples of talking about this concept of digital colonialism is this, which is the other Nefer the, the Nefertiti, um, you know, um, project. Some of you might know Nefertiti has is one of the most important um, artifacts from Egypt and through the last decades, there has been constant back and forth between the Egyptian government and the German government. Um, about returning the Nefertiti into Egypt, right, where it was kind of stolen. And the German government is like, we're not going to give it back to you. We basically have it here at the museum. And, and you know, that's the end of the story. So um, in some of the research that I was doing, I came across this, which is a replica of that, only possible this accurately, this beautifully, this close to the original version because of access to 3D scanners. And obviously, they're also selling it for... 8,900 euro, you can choose 10 of them. Um, and this other project, some of you might know, which is the other Nefertiti project by Nora Albadri and uh, John Nell, which uh, they connected the, a 3D scanner. I'm not gonna get into the uh, scandal of any of that, but what they did was they did a performance where they got into a museum and scanned the, the Nefertiti at the museum in Germany. Uh, because the, the museum wouldn't give them the 3D scanned uh, model, which they wanted. Also, Nora uh, Albadri being from Egypt, she was working on a project and they wouldn't give it to her. So they were like, okay, we're going to do this guerrilla style performance. They went there, scanned it, and then released this HD, super like high quality model of the Nefertiti had online open source publicly. So this made a lot of noise and buzz around, again, access questions of... Um, this kind of power dynamic between museums, Western museums, and their access to knowledge and material and histories of other countries, um, and kind of all the ethical questions around that. We also have, you know, this problem of alignment, words getting used in a lot of these websites as shared heritage or our, our histories, our cultures, you know, hum humans all being the same. So this is our past as well, which this kind of language gets used over and over in a lot of these projects. For example, SciArc, collaborating with Google Arts and Culture, where they um, use these words as a way to say that we also share this culture. So the fact that we're coming and taking this material means that, you know, doesn't mean much because it's, it's a past that belongs to everyone. Um, again, the, the problematic alignment that has been ways that colonization of histories and cultures has been justified for many, many years. This is just a new version of it. And then the problem of white savior, which is this us versus them. So we are here to save this culture in the places that are in conflict or they don't know how to save it because obviously they're not taking good care of it. So we're going to do it because we have better resources. Things to think about and question. I'm not going to get into a detail of that as much. Um, but then we arrive to the archive. 
And that's something that because of my, you know, three, three, four years of constant thinking and giving lectures and writing about Disha colonialism, looking for different examples. Um, when it came to releasing the f this basically five years of information and material that I had gathered, I really wanted to think about um, this question. Is open source inherently good or positive, right? So we we think about open source a lot of times as something that is good because we're sharing these things. I mean, I also would say that be prior to like maybe like before four or five years ago um i mean i was already thinking about the problems with that and what that means with material speculation project but i think i was also kind of like more open to the idea of it but a lot of these experiences and thinking like really changed the way that i thought about wanting to release the material on the archive so um this is the website to the archive and I am just going to quickly walk you through it. So if you know English, you can have access to the first layer of the website, which, you know, takes you to these parts where you can download the PDF. You can read about all the information about what this material is. And I also have made a gallery for the, the, the sections that has images focused on, again, specifically queer um, genderless figures, female figures. And so here, again, like there's different sections. There's a whole part on selected goddess names from two material that are specifically a, a West Asia focused goddess names, um, like and also mostly like dark goddess figures. And before I go to the second layer, I wanted to also give credit to um, Emily Martinez. Um, Antonia Begari, who did the development of, of this project, uh, the design of the website, and also all the amazing people who were part of this, helping with different different aspects of it. Angeline with the part I can't, the, a little bit hacking of it. I was like, should I tell the secret? But the hacking parts of some of the things, thank you for that. And um, I will explain that process. So anyway, um, now to get into other parts of um, the, the archive, you will have to know either Farsi or Arabic to get to it. So this thing pops up telling you, giving you a set of instructions. It says like, if you want it to open, put in this and this and that, and then um, bury it under the soil, which obviously not real, that part. But the reason I kind of like wanted to build these like layers or like define these like cultural codes is kind of goes back to that questions of open access, right? What does it mean to protect knowledge, protect our histories, protect the ways that um, we want to share this knowledge uh, versus also still being generous and like sharing some parts of the knowledge. So the way that I curated um, the second, third and fourth layer is that the material that are as, as you go further and further, the material becomes more rare material that we scanned for first time and are not just like available online but one of the constant problems that i would run into when i was trying to uh, you know have access to some of these uh, material in the digital library of like let's say harvard university or another university was that one either they wanted me to sign a contract saying that um you need to credit us for like putting this on a website or something and um, I was like, I don't want to credit you. Like, I'm just taking something from my country and I'm, I'm like, you know, that is from like thousands of years ago. Like, it's like no copyright on it. And I want to just do it for free, like as part of my project. So it was kind of like a little bit of back and forth between that stuff. Also, there were a lot of websites that would not, when you, you know, these digital libraries where they had the PDF files, but when you go, would go on the websites, you would only see the thumbnail or like the small image, low quality image. Or you would have to click on them one by one, like 500 pages, one by one, to download each image. Like they wouldn't just give you one PDF. So those were some of the parts that we, you know, we had to like figure out like codes and stuff to then download it in like bulk download. Um, or the problem of just giving access to black and white images and not colored. So all these, again, ways that these museums and Western based museums kept like creating different gates as a way to gather this material. And for me, then this became about, you know, building two folders, one I called a, um, for us and then one I, one I called for all, where then these layers then now goes to the for us section. So I'm just gonna 
actually show you a little bit of this. And then here you go again into like more material and have access to like more stuff. And when you click here, um, tells you to put in like this new code and um, to burn it in the fire to see wonders. And um, yeah, some more resources here. And the last layer is this one, which says to type certain numbers and codes and alphabet and write it on the skin of um, a deer before sunset. And yeah, that's the last part, which has, again, this is the part that has like some of the the material that was either the hardest to have access to or I didn't have permission to put out and um, and material we 3D scanned. So yeah, I kind of like want to end this talk here with like hoping that we can kind of keep thinking about all these ways of um, contributing or, 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 you know, as, as artists, creative people, uh, what does it mean when we have access to platforms and how can we kind of constantly think about or push the ways that we can uh, question power structures that for many, many, many years have been in play that we take for granted and practices that have been just the way it is that I think we can push and resist and think about um, different ways to turn around. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marishin, for this uh, impressive talk, lecture, performance. It was really great listening to you and I enjoyed it. I hope all of you do. Uh, we are finished now, but still we have time for questions from audience. So if you would like to ask artists something, now is the chance, now it's time. Anyone? If you're also sitting in the back, I can't see you, so if you raise your hand, maybe you can see them. Yeah, we can... I think I can see anyone. No? Come on, guys, I know you have a question. <laughs> it can be personal, I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah, there is one. Um, sorry, I could hear the first part. So talk about the story about my the grandma. Yeah, yeah, like I feel like I feel like there's a bit more to that. <laughs> Can you elaborate? Like I don't believe that was it. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean that was as I said, like I remember like the in, in, in the text I say it, but like I remember like we had this it was me and like a couple of my cousins and like it was like a summer night and we like went and lied down on the rooftop and then my grandmother told me this story, which by the way, as a kid, I was like horrified by it, you know, that's like thinking about like you saw a djinn and like she like said that like you know she went and saw the a, a, a djinn but like first saw there were these women but then they had hooves and you know i thought about that for like so so many years like it like really was one of those scary stories that stayed with me um and yeah but it was like again as i said growing up in iran like people talked about djinn stories like all the time um and it's i know it's the same in like many other islamic cultures where it, people talk about encounters with jen or like different ways of um, seeing it and what they are is that you know as as these like creatures you can either pos like use their power to possess other people or you might be possessed by them you know so there are all these like talismans and texts that are written about summoning the jinn or um kind of um how do you call it? Like going against it if you're like possessed by it. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I elaborated enough on your question. Yeah, okay, go. Yeah. Please take the mic if possible. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, uh, you thank you, and you show just show that website about archive, and I was wondering, is this, uh, is the content only available in other language like English? I mean, oh. the the first the first layer is in. I mean, the the PDFs and the material that are there are all in Farsi or Arabic, like the material that I'm sharing. And then the first layer is where you can you have access to it if you know English. I mean, but then for the other layers, only if you know Farsi or Arabic. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, you have. Yes. Um, well, thank you, first of all. I think the last part is really interesting about um, how much information you decide to share and for whom the information um, is directed to. And I think uh, at one point, by making it um, available only in two languages, um, at what point, I mean, then again, you have all these layers, so I feel it's a bit an onion that you peel off, but then are you not afraid that it will become too encrypted again? So the information at one point will be very closed off again. So you open it up, but at one point, um, well, until when does it become accessible for others? Are you wonder about that? That's what I think of. Um, that's a good question, but like I think as the contemporary practices again of like museums and spaces like digital libraries and libraries like stay the same in a way that they have that kind of granted permission like lifetime or like they like these like unethical practices of like ownership and copyright and who gets to keep what you know is in effect I feel like I want to I want to kind of find a space that is yeah that is like very defined in sense of what is it that I'm giving away and to who you know um and I think people relate to that material also very differently when it is something that for example a gin as a let, let's say I'm just giving you an example as a figure that is like very honored in our cultures right like um I might not like believe in it in a way that my grandmother did but I also honor it as something that is, you know, that like thought about and like has become part of like these stories compared to then some like stupid, like fun, whatever, Aladdin genie that like kind of completely like takes away that image and like makes something that like has nothing to do with the whole the history of like a creature again, that culturally is so important. Um, and then people's perception of a gen obviously the like, genie becomes that, you know, that one figure. And this is just one example, but like take that and like think about, like when I was researching some of these like figures or like names, not the ones that I ended up working on, but then in the video game culture, for example, they've like taken and like, like lived and ruined into like these like weird games or like these figures, the way they're like, I'm just imagining like some white men behind their computers modeling these things, you know? And like kind of the complete removal of like some history of some heritage of something that means something to some other people, right? So those are some of the things I think about, like what does access mean? How does that change other people's relationship to it? And for now, I think I'm comfortable with, you know, building a space that is for like a specific group of people. Again, in this case, whoever who has either is from the, the Arab world or countries that speak Farsi or knows the language. Obviously, you can cheat the system. Like I'm, you know, you can have a friend who speaks it and get into the thing. I understand that, but like it then becomes about those choices, right? Yeah. Do we have more? We have one more question. Thank you. Wow. Um, this is maybe a very open question, but like, what's your relationship to oral tradition versus written tradition or the female act of writing? Um, I think both have been very important in my practice in terms of narrative and writing and bringing stories together. Um, so when I was actually when I was when I was 15, um, I well since I was 12 to 15, I wrote a book, a novel, 384 pages. Like I'm that nerd, but like it was published when I was 16 and it it's like it was all about my grandmother's life because she would tell me 
all these stories about her life all the time. She was Kurdish. My father's family were Kurdish, and she would like talk to me about her life and the struggle of like women in and you know in this like very like patriarchal society in Kurdistan. And um, I was very close to her. I grew up, you know, she lived in our house, and so I was like super close to her. Grew up with her, like spent a lot of time with her. And so the oral history, like the way she would tell me these stories and stuff, like always kind of became such an important part of my way of thinking about storytelling and how it can be very influential or ways that you can connect to someone completely stranger by the way that person tells you a story about them, you know. Um, and that, I think, has shaped a lot of my way of thinking about writing. Obviously, now mine is much more text-based or these stories that I'm finding, I'm sure, a lot of them were just oral stories about these mythical figures and then they became more like written down at some point. Um, yeah, I think I constantly am between those two worlds and I see why each of them matter for different reasons that are, and important, not just in my practice, but for, for the world. Thank you. Any more questions? At least I cannot see any fingers or hands. Okay, then we are going to finish. Thank you so much, Morrison. Thank Morishin. you so much, everyone. Um, thank you. <laughs> On behalf of Futures Photography and Melchweg, I would like to thank you all for being with us all day. Tomorrow is our second day of the conference and I'm inviting you to join us. We will be here from the morning and live from 1 p.m. So have a nice evening and see you tomorrow.